I hereby call this meeting of the Public Safety Committee to order. Uh, we have a couple of items on uh, this evening's agenda. We have an item, it's an information item on the Forsyth County Hazard Mitigation Plan. And that's also an item updating us on the police body cameras. Uh, before we get started with the consent agenda, uh, I will say I want to recognize some of our Public Safety Department heads. Uh, Chief Barry Roundtree was here from the Police Department. Chief, raise your hand so we can see you. Uh, we also have Chief Anthony Farmer, who's our Fire Chief. Uh, we have Mr. Mel Sadler with our Emergency Management Department. Uh, we also have Ms. Uh, Tonique McCullough uh, with the Department of Transportation. And I want to take a moment to recognize Ms. Marlene Davis. Uh, Ms. Ms. Davis, raise your hand. Uh, Ms. Davis is our new Vehicle for Hire Inspector. Uh, she came to us in May of this year from the Department of Transportation. And before coming to DOT, she worked as uh, our Utilities Engineering Technician. And she's worked there for the last 20 years. So Ms. Davis, welcome and uh, we look forward to, to great things out of you. Uh, Councilman Burke is recognized. Yes, thank you. Uh, oh, congratulations on all of you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, city manager, and to our people who've been recognized, I feel at this time I need to make a statement. I was listening to television, and it stated that with the cameras, that Winston-Salem Police Department has taken the lead. And I sat here under the directions as the chairman for 36 years, public safety chair. I gave this chairmanship up by choice to the vice chair to make him the chair. I want to say something I feel is very important, uh, Mr. City Manager, since you manage this city, we have 230 some thousand people in this city and we've been very concerned about the safety and welfare of this city. We have been transparent in what we have done in this city when it comes to the safety, welfare of all citizens in this community. And I have asked the city manager, in fact, I had a conversation with the mayor. I said, we should take some kind of stand. We should let the citizens know that we are not some other city. We are Winston-Salem, North Carolina. That we have a well-trained police department. And as I said to Chief Surratt years ago, when he came to me as a chief to tell me that he wanted me to know how he respected me being made the uh, chairman of the public safety. And he said, Ms. Burke, I want you to know I want our police department to do a good job. He said, if it's anything that we need to be doing, don't call me down front. Have a meeting with me. And I said, Chief Surratt, if you have one bad apple, you need to get rid of that bad apple. And I've had the experience of working with Chief Surratt, Chief Sweat, Chief Powell, <coughs> Chief Cunningham, and now Chief Browntree. And I want the citizens in this community to know that anything that we have voted to happen in this city, that we were aldermen who supported it, and now we are council people who support it. We don't have to hide behind anything. When the President of the United States has called in people to be examples, they talk about what they are going to do. We can tell them what we have done. And we can say with our citizens, we have the open door policy. In any of the disagreements or conflicts that we've had in this community, where there was a riot some years ago, citizens came together. If it was a situation with the Daryl Hunt, Deborah Sipes, we involved citizens' input and came up with the Lassiter study to look at how we would work together to improve our city. If it was the Silk Forest, we have done the same thing. And I have directed this city manager to make sure what we have done. Let the citizens in this community know it is not what people tell you we are doing. It is what we know we are doing. And that his door is open. And we have a chief of police who gets out of his car and walks through the neighborhoods. He has been a very open, above board, 
transparent chief of police. We have nothing to hide. And I'm sure he understands clearly if he has police who are not going to do their jobs, who will have problems in how they do their jobs, we will let them find the door without hesitating. Because we here on this committee and on this council, we represent all of the people. And I have thought over and over again, how can we let some folks who are not well informed know that we have nothing to hide? If there's any groups who would like to talk, I'm sure the chairman of this committee is open for suggestions and recommendations, and the city manager also. Mr. Chairman, I felt it was important for me to say that because as I have told some, we are not a burger. We are not a New York. We're not a Cleveland, Ohio. We are Winston-Salem, and we want to say to you, we feel we are unique. We do not hide behind what we ought to out front be doing as the mayor and council members for this city of Winston-Salem, with this city manager who we direct to make sure our police department is not pushovers. I don't want nobody to misunderstand that. And if they're doing wrong people, then they're going to have to pay a price. And we must encourage our young folks, when the police talk with them, to be polite and courteous. And if you feel they're unfair to you, then get in touch with your elected official, and the elected official will get in touch with the city manager, and the city manager will get in touch with the police chief, and the police chief will then get in touch with the department that works with grievances. And if that is not enough, that is why we have a Citizens Police Review Board. And we will make sure that we continue to hold high our standards. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Burke. Uh, I'll also just say that in, in this city, as the new chairman of public safety, we've been upfront, outright, we've been transparent. Uh, we have tried to be trailblazers on the national stage and ensure that we're doing what's right for all of our citizens with the help of the police department, all our public safety professionals, uh, and the police body cameras, all of our folks on the streets wearing body cameras is one way that we're doing that. Uh, so we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, members of the committee, are there any items on the consent agenda that should be pulled for discussion? C2. Item C2. Uh, if there are no other items, I would entertain a motion. motion properly second any discussion all in favor please say aye any opposed uh, that is unanimous item c2 please item c2 consideration of ordinances renewing the certificates of public convenience and necessity of three taxi cabs three limousines and one horse-drawn carriage service in the city of winston-salem councilman mcintosh is recognized i pulled this because i'm not sure I, no i am sure i don't understand the reasoning behind the regulations of how we treat taxi cabs. And we're getting ready to deal with, as a city or as a state, I know as a nation, we're all we're dealing with the sharing economy. And I'd like to I'd like to have a better understanding of how and why we regulate taxi cabs in the city wants to say. It's not about any particular item in this. And I don't know if that's something for discussion tonight or if I should ask to bring that back as a as an item at another occasion. Yeah, Mr. Turner, if you can bring that item back in detail, but in the meantime, if you can give us a brief summary on, on, on why we do taxi cabs and vehicles for hire here locally. I think the council decided some time back that it wanted to regulate taxis primarily in order to have some level of assurance about the amount that's charged to citizens and about the condition of the cabs. One of the things that has been discussed was whether council ever made a conscious decision to regulate the number of cabs. And based upon activities and actions by the council over the years, it's our impression that you've not decided that you wanted to regulate the number or restrict the number, but that you did want to have comfort that the numbers that you were issuing uh, were being put on the street. So you implemented a requirement that 50% of the certificates issued had to be used for vehicles actually operating on the street. But council has never said that the city of Winston can 
only handle X number of cabs, and that's all that would be allocated to the industry. Uh, but be happy to bring you more detailed information on the history of the cab regulation process from the time when it was in the police department to the time that it moved to the city's Department of Transportation and the various iterations and modifications that have been made to the ordinance over time. Yeah, Mr. Turner, I, I truly believe that as a city we've done a good job with uh, regulating our cabs and vehicles for hire, and I think we've got a good person in place with Ms. Marlene Davis to help, help us to uh, continue that process along with Ms. Tony McCullough, who's our director. Councilman McIntosh. I guess one of the other questions I'd like to have in this report back is how is the, num the number of cabs increased over, over time? Has it? And if so, by how much? And if it has increased, does that say something about our bus service? Are we forcing people to take cabs? So we're not providing adequate bus service? I'm okay with that as a coming back. So do you want me to make a motion then? Yeah, with, with, the, with the understanding that the information will come back, and I saw by now that Mr. Turner has agreed to bring that back. I'll, I would entertain a motion at your convenience. Uh, move to approve C2. Second. Motion probably second. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposes likewise. That is unanimous. Uh, that completes our consent agenda. We'll now move forward with the general agenda, uh, moving to item G1. Item G1, information on the Forsyth County hazard, hazard mitigation plan. And giving the report on the Forsyth County hazard mitigation plan is our emergency management director, uh, Mr. Mel Sattler. Mr. B Mr. Sattler, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> Good evening, uh, members of the committee. Good evening. We are here for just a brief overview to talk about the Forsyth County Hazard Mitigation Plan. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, a few uh, portions of it. This is a five-year plan, as you can see from the cover here. It was developed in 2010, so next year we'll be Revising this plan, and there's a little bit more that's going to be involved in that, and we'll explain to that explain that in just a moment. As a reminder, we want to make sure that everyone remembers that mitigation uh, has twofold purpose. Number one, it, those are the measures that we take to eliminate a hazard, and number two, those are the measures that we take to eliminate the effects of a hazard. So it could be either one, depending on the situation and what the hazard is. The requirement for the plan comes from the uh, Disaster Mitigation Act of 2000 from the federal level and the North Carolina Senate Bill 300, uh, which was developed in 2001. The rationale is pretty simple. We're going to reduce risk uh, to property and person. We want to build our resiliency and st sustainability, and of course, we want to reduce the burden on local government, which is always our objective. Now, this is <coughs> the cycle that, that from, from which our planning goes. I won't bore you with all the details of that. I just want to point out two elements of it. To the right there, or well, toward the middle, you see that we have goals, and just to the right of that, you see that we have mitigation actions. Those are the two areas we're going to concentrate on just briefly this evening. And as you can see, the entire process is a circular one in that we, we begin <coughs> and end uh, with the uh, hazard identification and the other profile information. Now, the plan that we have currently involves all jurisdictions. By that, I mean all nine jurisdictions that, that are within Forsyth County. Uh, in 2010, you, the, this, uh, the full council approved our uh, plan, and of course it was approved by all the other eight jurisdictions. And of course, involved in developing that plan was fire, law enforcement, public works, city county planning, stormwater schools, ex utilities, et cetera, et cetera. So there were an awful lot of agencies and departments that were involved in developing this plan. And of course, we had non-governmental agencies, such as the American Red Cross, the Salvation Army, and others. We had state and federal involvement, and we had others uh, in local businesses and higher planning, primarily our stakeholders in Forsyth County. Now, <clears throat> I, I said earlier that there's going to be a change, and this is basically our change. When we have our new plan in 2015, it will involve seven counties. We've been encouraged by the federal uh, government to do uh, to, well, to consolidate our work and try to do on a, work on a regional basis as opposed to a singular county basis. Obviously, they want to reduce the number of plans. They're looking at 100 plans now for each county, so if, they can if we can consolidate those plans and do it on a regional basis, that's what they want us to do. We've been asked to take the lead, and we've been working toward that uh, end, and in 2015, we will bring you a plan for approval that will involve seven, seven counties rather, and 37 jurisdictions. So it's going to expand uh, significantly, but it'll be uh, well done, and we're working with a vendor 
and a contractor in order to accomplish that purpose. I mentioned earlier we had uh, goals. We are going to talk briefly or mention the four goals that, that the group came up with, and we'll walk, work into how we're going to accomplish those goals. First, of course, is to protect public health, safety, and welfare by increasing public awareness of hazards and by encouraging collective and individual responsibility for mitigating hazard risk. What do we need to do in order to accomplish the goal in order to reduce the risk? Same thing that I talked about, mentioned a minute ago when I talked about mitigation and the purposes of mitigation. Second goal, improve technical capability. As technology evolves, we need to take a look at all the possible means that we have available to us in order to uh, achieve our goals. And this is what we're kind of saying in, in uh, longer, in more words, I guess, but that's essentially what we're talking about, in, in taking advantage of technology that's available to us for mitigation purposes. Third goal, enhance existing or creating a new policies and ordinances. This is what we always do. This is what government is about, creating ordinances and policies. So we recognize that those uh, elements or those measures will be necessary in order to complete our mitigation goals. And fourth, protect the most vulnerable populations, buildings, and critical facilities through the implementation of cost-effective and technically feasible mitigation action. There are lots of things we'd like to do, but some things that you, you, we just simply can't do. Uh, it's beyond our resources or it's beyond feasibility at this point. But we are aware of that, and we want to make sure that we are able to resolve all the mitigate, or as many mit mitigation issues as possible through the means that are available to us. Now, we're going to talk real quickly about mitigation actions on, from, in, from our mitigation action info sheets. This is just a blank to show you what it looks like, uh, the format. At the top, you see our proposed action. You'll see a section there where the gray boxes, is, what boxes are for the history. And now at the bottom, a little more explanation as far as the details of the goals, excuse me, the action, mitigation actions. First one, we're going to revise, update, and locally adopt floodplain maps. This is going on right now. Uh, we're taking. Uh, measures in order to accomplish that. We're working with the state of North Carolina, which has been designated as an independent state. We don't have to wait for the FEMA to do it for us. The state of North Carolina is, is uh, authorized to work toward this end, and we're doing that at this moment. Uh, and if you're interested in the details, you do have copies uh, of your, in your briefing book. Uh, so I won't read that all to you, but you can see that, of course, this is an ongoing project and it has already begun. Second mitigation action, equip an emergency shelter with alternate power source. This is really uh, something that we're working toward, but this is not, doesn't mean a shelter with uh, a generator. This is We're talking about mobility in order to uh, accomplish that goal, because we can't just designate a shelter, because we don't know what the hazards are going to be, and we don't know the location of it, so we're going to make this a mobile operation with a generator and the connection and the appropriate connections within several schools. And we're working with the school system now to accomplish that, but we've not reached that goal, that uh, mitigation yet, action yet. We're going to install stream gauges. We would like to install stream gauges <coughs> along flood-prone streams for flood warning and alerting purposes. This is a pretty expensive prospect here. Uh, we believe that the long-term benefit will, there will be a long-term benefit from it, but it costs a great deal, and we're not really uh, at the point yet where we're able to do that. Uh, so this is, as you can see down at, at, uh, in the lower box, there talks about this being a, in the moderate category as opposed to a high priority. We're going to work towards putting stream gauges at Muddy Creek at Highway 67 and Renola Road at Salem Creek. These are two of our most flood-prone areas. And every time we have a really, really heavy rain, this is where we get a lot of flooding. So we think that's where the gauges should be. And we're going to uh, acquire technology. I mentioned a minute ago, acquiring technology. We'd like to put Web EOC, uh, Web EOC, which is a software package for resource management communication software in our emergency operations center. We've talked about this before. We're going to work toward that again. Uh, our IT people are currently exploring this possibility with the vendor, and we'll have a, a proposal for this shortly. And again, this is a high priority because we feel like this is going to be a basic element that we're going to have to have as time goes on. And uh, uh, the other mitigation action is to update and maintain our Ready for Scythe website. And Ready for Scythe uh, is the social media and Ready for Scythe web application for media devices on a daily basis. This is an ongoing project. We've been fortunate. We've started this uh, website in 2008, I believe it was. And we've been fortunate enough to grant it, uh, fund it with grant funds uh, since it started. And we'd like to continue that. 
but we, th we think it's a vital uh, part of our mitigation efforts. I mentioned what it read for Cypher. Here's a better uh, explanation of what we're talking about from the standpoint of, uh, you may have seen this sign. We've had splendid cooperation from several of, of the local sign vendors, and they, they've run this ad for us for nothing. So, <laughs> so we're kind of pleased about that, and we want to encourage everybody to look at Ready for Cypher as frequently as possible. If we have an emergency or if we have a, uh, a serious situation, uh, disaster, uh, there'll be some information there <clears throat> available to the public on a pretty short notice uh, from Reddit for Scythe at that website. Are there any questions? Mr. Sadler, let me just say thank you for that presentation. Thank you. Uh, I have the opportunity to visit the, the Reddit for Scythe website. Like I say, it's a wonderful website. And I know we asked you the same question. You know, I've been, this is, I'm working on my sixth year on this committee. And we ask you the same question every time you come. And we want to know, uh, Mr. Seller, are we prepared? We believe that we are, sir. Yes, sir. I, uh, I can say that we are. We believe that we are. We've taken all kinds of measures. Uh, we have a number of elements, elements that we put together, such as the mitigation plan, the emergency operation plan, and all the other training that we do. And we think that through integration of all those resources, we should be prepared for practically anything that can happen to us. I, one thing I've neglected to mention, excuse me, by, uh, while I have the floor, uh, the plan itself in its entirety is available on the Ready for Site website. And I wanted to make sure I said that before I sat down. And I'll reiterate it. The plan is, is available on the Ready for Scythe website. Yes, sir. And if you can give this, that website, please. That's uh, readyforsythe.org. Thank you, sir. Councilman McIntosh. To go to uh, Councilman Taylor's question, if there's something that your group realizes we are not ready for, what's the process to to prepare for that? Let's say there's a new threat that comes up to you. It's not in our playbook. Well, we just recently went through that, as a matter of fact, with Ebola. Uh, we have no previous planning experience with the uh, for planning for that kind of a pandemic, well, that particular disease, I should say, pandemic. And we had a pretty close uh, scrutiny as far as getting our community partners together. Community health, uh, excuse me, public health would be the lead agency in a situation like that. And we do have a management system to work with those, uh, with that uh, leadership and with the other agencies that are involved, our fire department, our police department, and others have been involved in our Ebola planning. Uh, we think, again, that we've got most of the, in our hospitals, I should mention, certainly. Uh, we think we've handled that from the standpoint of an unknown threat that we were, this time last year, we didn't know what Ebola was. <laughs> but since that time, we've had an opportunity to evolve and to uh, get our resources together and our response has been organized in that respect. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Any questions for Mr. Sadler? If not, Mr. Sadler, uh, we thank you once again for coming and giving the report. And I think we're satisfied that we're prepared in the case of an emergency. We appreciate you again, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Item G2, please. Item G2, update on police body cameras. And let me just say, as our police chief makes his way to the podium, uh, we've heard the words from, from our, our mayor pro temp. Uh, I will say that, you know, I, I won't talk about the Ferguson situation or anything that's going on across the country, but I think it's prudent that we not focus on those things that divide us. And I think we should focus on those things that unite us. I think everyone, whether you're a citizen, or whether you're a police officer, or any other public safety personnel wants to be treated with dignity, respect, fairness, openness, and transparency. And this is our attempt at doing that. Uh, it's given us national attention, but again, in, on this committee, in this city, uh, it's important that we're trailblazers and we're out in front on doing what's right. Chief, we recognize, sir. Thank you. Good evening, Chairman Taylor and uh, members of the Public Safety Committee. Thank you for allowing me to speak very briefly on the update on the body cameras. As you mentioned, we are one of the uh, leaders in the nation as far as our uh, body camera project. Of course, we uh, initiated our body camera project pre-Ferguson. Uh, Currently, right now, we have 130 body-worn cameras deployed in the department. They are deployed throughout the agency in primarily our patrol division, K-9, our SRO program, and also our traffic enforcement unit in our downtown bike patrol. And before any officer is issued a body camera, they go through a block of training. And that training includes the uh, proper use, the uh, proper care of the equipment. Uh, our instructor here teaches them how to download the body cameras through evidence.com. 
And also we have a very strong policy that dictates uh, when the camera is turned on and when it's turned off. And I'll get into some of those things here in a few minutes. Uh, but mainly all encounters with mem members of the public when acting in an official capacity, we have to have the body cameras running. Also for all dispatch calls, we have the body cameras running. Any emergency call where the vehicle is being operated with uh, emergency equipment, meaning blue lights and siren, the cameras are operating. All traffic stops, officers are required to have the cameras running. When transporting non-departmental uh, uh, folks in our police cars in the real area, we're required to have the cameras operating and all processing of uh, arrestees at the detention center. And of course, with that said, there are some situations where we do turn the cameras off. Of course, if a person is at one of the uh, medical facilities and we're in their custody, there may be an, a, a reason why we have to turn the camera off. Also doing, um, currently right now, doing uh, proper cause hearings in front of the magistrates, we turn the cameras off. And of course, if one of the SROs is going into a locker room or a restroom at one of the schools, of course, we turn the cameras off then. But any other interactions with the public when we're taking official uh, enforcement action or either operating uh, in a official capacity, we do require that the officers have the cameras running. Uh, also, there are checks and balances as far as uh, supervisors' responsibilities. Supervisors have the responsibility of periodically going back and reviewing any videos that their uh, officers under their chain of command record. Officers cannot change the video. They cannot delete the videos once it's uploaded into uh, evidence.com. They can only view their recordings. For example, if I had a camera, I couldn't go in and look at Sergeant Wright's uh, video. Unless I'm an administrator, and there are only very few administrators or people in the police department that have administrative rights. Sergeant Wright, being the in-house expert, he has administrative rights where he can go in and uh, make sure that the videos are labeled properly and supervisors can go in and view officers' videos. But even supervisors cannot change, they cannot delete, they cannot do anything to that video. And that's through evidence.com. And there's an audit trail for, um, for anyone who views that video. Or if that video is shared with the court system, for example, there's an audit trail saying that uh, we shared the video with uh, uh, assistant DA such and such and such, or we shared it with the defense as, as part of the uh, discovery process. But we cannot change it, we cannot delete it, we cannot manipulate the video once it's uploaded into evidence.com. I think that's a brief overview if anybody has any questions about the project. Well, Chief, uh, I'll have a question. But I think our, our resident uh, body camera specialist may be able to answer this, but you may be able to also. Okay. Uh, just Give us a brief informational on how the cameras work. Uh, one of the things that I've been getting out in the community is how do they work? And, and we have to tell most people once the cameras start, they actually record the interactions that have gone on before you press the start button. So could, could someone give us a, a brief uh, understanding of, of how the cameras actually work? Okay, they do have that capacity, but I'll let Sergeant Wright explain <laughs> that. So I can make Sergeant Wright. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> the cameras work. They have a 30 second pre event buffering system set up on them. So, like Officer Whelan in the back is wearing his camera. It, once he presses the event button two times to start the camera to record, it captures 30 seconds of video prior to when he pressed that button. So, 30 seconds of any activity that took place before that, it's going to capture it just video, not audio. But once he taps the button, from that point forward, it captures audio and video. How, Councilman Belay. How can it record something 
before you turn it off. It's it is constantly buffering. <laughs> when the camera is on, it's powered on, and it's constantly buffering. Kind of like our in-car cameras right now that we have, they have the same feature on them. They're set up to capture 30 seconds before, before the camera turns on. There's other systems in place inside the car that the right now the body camera doesn't have, so it's constantly looping. If you've ever seen a closed circuit TV in like a retail store or at a restaurant, most of those are set up the same way where they constantly loop. Once you press the event button and it starts recording, now it captures that video, that information before then, saves it, and adds when you started recording to it and saves that file. It's magic. It's magic. Okay. Yeah. Are there any other questions for Sergeant Wright? I know there's some questions again for the Chief. Councilmember Adams is recognized. Yes. Um, and I don't know Sergeant Wright whether you can answer this, maybe. I've had some questions from the community such as, okay, we have the car cams and now we have the body cams. How do they work in tandem with one another? When are they possibly used together? And how is that? I mean, some people, you know, citizens are suspect of our car cams and now they're wondering again, now since we got body cams, how is all of this working together in tandem to provide uh, the best scenario or, or, or uh, picture of what actually has happened uh, in the interaction of the officer with this citizen? Well, the in-car cameras, as when we started this venture into going to body cameras, we started going towards this because the in-car cameras were aging out. We were at a point where we needed to look at, do we continue with just in-car cameras or do we take the next step into the future of law enforcement going with body-worn cameras. The in-car cameras only capture what happens in front of the patrol car. We were aging out where we needed to make a decision, are we gonna stay with that or are we gonna go with body cameras? We went with body cameras. The body cameras goes with the officer wherever he goes, so it captures all of the events wherever the officer's at. The, we feel as an agency that the body camera offers us the best option to capture the most amount of video that we can with an interaction with a member of the public. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Sergeant Wright. Yes, sir. Uh, Chief Roundtree, Councilman McIntosh. I will add that the two systems are totally separate, the in-car uh, system and the body-worn uh, camera system. They're totally separate. So both of them can be operating at the same time. There's a question to my list. Does that mean we'll be phasing out the car cameras over time? Yes. Okay. Great. And the reason, uh, like Sergeant Wright said, we started the uh, in-car camera project late 2007, early 2008, and right now they're not making parts for them. We're spending a lot of money trying to keep the ones that we have running. So what's been our field experience so far? How many of these are out in the field right now? And we've had Right now we have 130 deployed okay. in the field. And so what's the experience been like? I guess my question goes to uploading. Has there been any problems with uploading? Has that been as seamless as, as it was right. portrayed to, to be? Uh, no problems as far as uh, uploading and, and uh, retrieving a video good. when we need it. How about acceptance within rank and file and then out with the outward community? How, how are people taking to them when they're faced with them? You know? Well, from what I've seen as far as acceptance from the rank and file, our younger officers uh, younger meaning uh, time at the department and age seem to accept the technology a little little better than some of the uh, seasoned in-service officers. I guess that's the best that's way to say it. <laughs> uh, but I haven't heard of any real resistance as far as uh, the officers in encountering citizens uh, with the cameras. Thank you. Councilmember Adams. Yes. Uh, Chief how many uh, total officers do we have? Uh, we, we are allotted 559 sworn positions, but we're mainly trying to outfit officers assigned to primary patrol, our school resource officers, our street crimes units, our uh, traffic enforcement units, and canines. And how, what's that number if you put all of that together out um, of 559? About 
350, 340 to 350. There are 252 assigned to primary patrol. And you add in street crimes, uh, we have 20 assigned to uh, SRO, uh, K-9, and a traffic enforcement of about 10, so about 340. When do we expect, and I guess that's the city manager, when do we expect to get more cameras or the rest of them? What, what, do, we got, what do we have on order right now? We have 210 on order. Of course, uh, city council approved that order in, um, in November. That order should be here uh, probably within the next month or so. Right now, Taser International, our company, is uh, backlogged, of course, because everybody now across the country placing orders for camera. And my last question is, have we had any concerns or issues uh, that would have required reviewing some of the footage since we started using the ones that we have? I wouldn't call it a concern, but as our normal process of uh, uh, supervisor responsibilities, we do watch the video. Now, our uh, PSD captain is here tonight also, uh, Captain Bricker. And of course, we have viewed some of the videos for citizen complaints. Yeah, that's what I'm basically what I'm talking about. Right. And we have used those, but I haven't, I'm not aware of any major concerns where there were issues that came up after viewing the video. Have we seen, from what we know right now, from the experiences we've had, uh, from your perspective, is it, I mean, is it kind of going the way we thought, the process, or do you think we still have more work to do on any of the process, the policies, the procedures, or anything like that, that we still can make it better? and? Uh, more transparent to the community and easier, easier for our officers? Well, of course, right now, I, I may be a little partial, but I think we have a strong policy because we put a lot of time and thought into it before we actually uh, started it. But we have seen uh, with quite a few successes with, with the camera project. In one major case, what the officer said uh, happened was actually proven on that video. Okay, thank you very much. And Chief, I think one of the things that we can do as we all have our community meetings and town hall meetings, the police department always shows up, but as you give us periodic updates to this committee on body cameras, we can also update the community on the fact that we're wearing body cameras and answering any questions or concerns. One last question, I think we'll let you go on this particular item. I think I remember at the last meeting, we talked about the battery life of those particular uh, cameras. I think every officer is gonna have two batteries, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, talk to me. Well, the battery life is designed to last uh, a complete shift. As far as two batteries, that's not in the, uh, we don't have two yet. Is that that's correct? The battery life on yeah. the reason we went with this particular item was because of the battery life. It's actually designed at a full charge to last 12 hours. That's under peak performance conditions, and we're actually seeing that the batteries do last 12 hours, sometimes a little bit longer. Um, if the battery starts to get worn down, we do replace them as soon as the officer notices that, that the battery's not lasting as long as it should. We haven't had any issues with an officer having the camera not have power through an entire shift. And Sergeant Wright, I think that's the last thing we would want. If we want to go back and look at the film, the last thing we want to hear is the battery was dead, we don't have the footage. What indicators are there to the officers that have the body cameras that the camera is running low? There are two indicators. One, the unit itself, the control of the battery, has a battery status button on it. The officer can press that button and it'll go through three light systems to let the officer know the amount of battery life left. Left, If it gets to the point where it's less than 20%, at a one point when the camera get notices realizes that there's less than 10% battery life, the camera will actually start beeping to notify the officer that the battery has less than 10% power left and that they need to get another battery. Okay. And does he have access to, does he, she have access to a battery in the vehicle? Or he has to go back to a, uh, They can go back to the police department or wherever their station's at and get another battery. But one of the unique things about this battery is all of our patrol cars, have either a cigarette lighter in them or a laptop, the battery can be charged in That's the vehicle. 
There you so go. they will have access to charge the battery throughout their shift if need be. All right, if there are no more questions for Sergeant Wright or Chief uh, Roundtree on this item, I'm gonna get you out of here really, really quickly. I, I, I wanted to make sure that the Chief gave us an update on another item that we're being a trailblazer on. Uh, as you all know, there are, the, the city of Winston-Salem has hundreds of cases, you know, kind of still waiting in our state crime lab for consideration. I know this committee moved forward uh, with uh, discussions and with the process of having our own crime lab here locally in Winston-Salem that will alleviate some of that process. It's my understanding that there are some cases here that have even been thrown out because we didn't have the information. Mm -hmm. So we're moving forward with having our own crime lab. We can generate some money by bringing in other municipalities and counties. And Chief, if you'll give us just a brief update on where we are with our, our local Winston-Salem crime lab. Oh, sure. Uh, at the time when I presented to uh, uh, this committee, we had about 367 uh, pending cases at the state uh, crime lab in Raleigh. Uh, currently, w we have all contracts uh, signed, uh, everything's in place. The company is uh, gradually starting to move in equipment. We anticipate the start date for the lab to be uh, fully operational around the first to the middle part of uh, March 2015. Uh, the lab will offer us an opportunity to, uh, <coughs> excuse me, have local testing of uh, uh, drugs and also blood alcohol content uh, testing at the laboratory. The laboratory is set up where uh, they can test uh, outside agencies uh, evidence for a fee, of course, uh, not any fee to the uh, citizens of Winston-Salem, but uh, there is a fee, fee structure that would be set up by the laboratory, a fee structure and also uh, 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 case tracking that would not be the uh, the uh, process of, of the Winston-Salem Police Department. And as agencies come in and use the lab, that can potentially reduce our costs over time. Also, it's in place where the uh, DA's office and the judges will try to get uh, restitution back from the individuals uh, whose drugs and or uh, alcohol content is tested through the laboratory. Great. And that money will return to the city. Great. Councilmember Light. Um, so our lab, take possession of it already. <laughs> our lab will, will not be doing any DNA uh, testing or anything like that. It's what, just the alcohol and drugs. Where the lab itself, uh, IFL lab, they do have the capacity to do DNA testing at their other laboratories. But our contract uh, here in this city is for uh, drugs and alcohol content. But if we need to send something to one of the other laboratories, they do have that capacity. Okay, thank you. So there is potential for partnership. Any other questions for Chief Round for, around tree in reference to our uh, crime lab? Thank you, sir. Thank uh, you. As a, a last matter of personal privilege, I'm gonna ask a particular gentleman if he would stand, uh, Fire Chief Anthony Farmer, would you stand please, sir? Uh, Chief Farmer didn't know I was gonna do this, but uh, one of the things I wanna say is this is what I understand Chief Farmer's last public safety committee meeting. Yes. Uh, Chief Farmer, I wanna thank you for what you've done for this city, uh, for the chief that you've been, and, and, and you've been the only chief that I've known since I've been on the council. So I think we've worked well together. Not only have we worked together uh, well, but this committee and the city council, we thank you in this city on behalf of all of the citizens for your service to this community. And I'm sure everybody wants to speak for themselves, but if everybody would please join me in giving Chief Farmer a round of applause. Chief, before you sit down, I think it's only fitting that you have just a couple of words. Now, we need to get out of here, so we're going we're gonna to keep it briefing. I'd like to say good evening to the chair, good evening. committee meetings management. No, I was not prepared for that tonight, <laughs> but I, I do appreciate that I'm not a person for personal accolades, but it has been a great career serving our city. I started here in 83, and I was not a firefighter by design. I was a musician and I was also a business guy, and I thought I was gonna be a chemist. <laughs> and I found out, and a teacher, and I found out I didn't like teaching because they, there were certain things we couldn't do as teachers in the 80s that they could do in the 60s. <laughs> and so I went into the firefighting business. It has been a rewarding career, a lot of challenge, yet a lot of opportunity in our city.
has done well in providing that service. I've been a part of that, and I really appreciate that opportunity for our city to have been a part of that. I appreciate what the staff is doing today, and I'm very excited about where I think the department will continue to go as we move forward with the business of fire protection in our city, and I thank you all very much for this opportunity and the opportunity to serve our city. Thank you. Thank you again, Chief Palmer. All right, is there, is there anything else uh, for the good of the order? There's no further business and no comments. We'll consider this meeting to be adjourned.